Thank you and good morning. Um, I am Dharma. Ga I am Dharma Ganeshan, and I will talk about um, requirement-driven model-based testing uh, applied on flight software, in particular the software bus module. And it's a collaboration work with quite a few people. Uh, some of them are here. Michael is here, and uh, I saw Dave and Alan. Um, I don't know whether Susie is here. Uh, so uh, you can also talk to us if if there are questions that are not answered today. Uh, I'll try to clarify later. Okay. Um, I work for Front Offer Center, which is an affiliate of University of Maryland. It's a separate organization. Um, we we do a lot of interesting applied research on so, uh, in, in 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 all sorts of uh, software verification and analysis. Um, I will talk about today uh, uh, model-based testing, in, in particular, and uh, apply it on software bus module and ex explain some issues that we detected, um, and then uh, draw some conclusions. Okay, so the, the, the project context is uh, based on the SAF project, software architecture, assur software assurance research program, in fact, sorry. An assurance approach to identify, test, and cover off nominal behavior is the uh, topic of our project. And we focus on off nominal testing in particular. Um, what we mean by off nominal is that we look for unexpected sequence of events and see how the system reacts for those kinds of events. and. Uh, test for out of range data values that a normal tester would try, uh, but uh, we would just explore more of those and uh, uh, try some environmental issues. In, in this particular talk, the environmental issues are, are out of the context, but in general, this is what we do uh, in, in terms of testing and off nominal behavior. Okay, so, uh, well, not a surprise, testing is important and even more important in uh, safety critical context, and failures are expensive. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about is software bus, and I will just recall this context diagram, which is drawn by uh, CFS architects, I believe. And uh, what you see is the software bus. That's basically the, I'll try this. Oh, it works. Uh, here is the software bus, which is the message broker. And there are different types of apps that get plugged in. Uh, some of them are reusable apps, and some of them are mission-specific apps, and so on. Some of them are core apps. Uh, so in order to test this software bus, uh, our focus is to test the software bus. We need a bunch of apps to send and uh, receive data from the bus. That's how we will test it. Uh, we are going to generate those bubbles, essentially, and uh, we can exhaustively test the bus. That's the idea. So, so our testing is to not test the apps, but to test the bus with the help of the apps that we will generate. Okay. Um, already, the, the team or the CFS team uh, have done a great job in producing a lot of unit tests. Um, we have done analysis of that uh, three, four years ago and uh, found out that the code analysis is very good, and, and meaning the coverage is very good, 100%, almost 100% coverage for, for many of the modules that we have looked into. Um, what I observed is that only test execution is automated, meaning all the test cases were hand uh, crafted. Um, so, so the tests are all somewhat detailed at the code level uh, unit tests, and uh, we don't really get a high level view easily. Um, and uh, the test cases assume the publishers and subscribers, they are running on the same task. So we are trying to resolve some of these limitations in our approach so we could uh, run uh, the software bus and assume there are multiple tasks simultaneously running and, and using the bus. So it's, it's a high level than unit test that we uh, already developed, or uh, actually developed by the CFS team. Okay. Um, Model-based testing is the solution that we uh, used in this project. It's a relatively new technology um, from, from an application standpoint. Not many projects have used it, but uh, uh, it's a very appealing. So we wanted to apply it and see how good it is. Uh, it's a black box approach, so we don't really uh, use the path and branches within the code. Uh, the, the model itself is abstracted away from the implementation details. Um, model describes the behavior of the system from outside, like how you would expect a bus to behave. That's encoded in the model. And we generate a lot of test cases from that particular model. And it's innumerable, basically. You could say, I want to have 500 test cases. You could customize what type of test cases you want using this approach. And it triggers uh, quite a lot of off nominal behaviors. May, may not trigger all of them, but a lot. Um, as you will see, some of the sample examples I will show. Um, so what does a tester do in a, in, in a traditional testing environment, tester writes test cases manually. In, in this case, the tester develops a model and, and, and presses a button essentially to generate a lot of test cases, okay? 
And uh, where does the model come from? The model comes from uh, functional requirements. There is a Word document uh, online. You could go to the CFS website, describes uh, different uh, requirements. And there's also APA documentation, fairly good documentation. So th those are the two major sources for us uh, to build the model. And uh, what we have done in this case is so-called model programs. So it's, it's like a yet another lightweight implementation of the bus. We will use as a golden model to compare against the real implementation. And uh, I will talk about that with some examples. The model program becomes the test oracle for us to compare whether the real bus works according to the expectation of the model program. Okay. All right. So a little bit about the software bus itself. Uh, maybe many of you already know about software bus, but I'll just quickly summarize it. Uh, it handles communication between uh, tasks or applications. Um, publish, subscribe, architecture style, meaning um, messages can be published by one task, it goes to the bus, and if there are matching subscribers, it, it should be delivered or it will be delivered. Um, what are the main features that we have modeled? Uh, we, we, we model functions related to creating a pipe, deleting a pipe, subscribe, unsubscribe, send, receive, those basic features of the bus we modeled. Um, and uh, what is so big about this, this effort is that um, it's not easy to test something like a concurrent architecture, right? Many, many of the presentations highlighted that fact. If you have multiple tasks, uh, you have problems with concurrency and so on. Um, in, in this case of uh, software bus, if we, if we generate randomly a lot of tasks, how, how are we going to coordinate all those tasks? Because uh, the order in which certain things happen matters. If a subscriber subscribes first to a message, then a publisher publishes it, then the subscriber should get the message. But if the publisher runs first, then the subscriber runs later, the message need not be delivered. So, so, so you have to control the different tasks in a correct way, otherwise the testing may not make much sense. Maybe you can find some other types of errors like crashing and so on, but not the functional errors. So, so, so we have developed a, a test architecture to control the coordination among the different tasks. And uh, using model-based testing, we would generate different bubbles uh, from, the, from the picture that I have shown earlier. All right, so what is the idea? The key idea is uh, based on so-called parent-child metaphor or, or parent-child architecture. So we view uh, every um, bubble as a, as a parent. At runtime, it will create new bubbles. Those will become child. And the parent will tell child what to do. Child will do the job, give the result back to the parent. The parent will decide whether is it okay or not. So we, we, we view child as a, like a slave and, and parent as a master. Uh, and, and the actual decision making is pushed to the parent to, to decide whether a sequence of events is, is correct or not. Okay. Um, at runtime, we span many number of child tasks. So all of the child tasks are instantiated from the same code base. Uh, all child tasks subscribe to all the events like creating a pipe, deleting a pipe, subscribe, unsubscribe, and all those things. Parent decides what command to send. So we use the software bus itself to communicate between parent and child, uh, just to make the communication easier between those tasks. Okay. Uh, which is not risky because we have assertions generated in the end. So if we make a mistake in our uh, uh, child code, we will get it uh, detected. Okay. So so this is the picture representation. Uh, there is a parent who has a result pipe. Uh, he needs the results from the child, and the child has a command pipe so that he gets the command from the parent. He will execute the API of the software bus, get the result, and send it back to the parent for the comparison whether the expected. Uh, return code matches the actual return code. By the way, we test using the return code. So uh, API design has a nice return code structure. Success, failure, and all those things are defined. So we base our testing on that. Okay. Um, all right. So what is an example uh, command sequence we will generate? For example, we generate uh, a, a sequence like this. Uh, parent says to child number one, go and create a pipe and tell me what was the result. Okay, child one will do that. And the parent will ch tell child number one, go and subscribe a message uh, on a particular pipe. And then he will send the result back to the parent. Parent will check, uh, is it okay or not? And then parent will tell child two to go and publish a message. And then he will ask child one to check whether he got a message or not. So, so basically we generate this command sequence for many different combinations. Essentially the model is the one that's going to generate such a sequence. Okay. So, what is the modeling technology we have used? Uh, we base our model using a, a Microsoft plugin called Spec Explorer. It's a plugin to the Visual Studio environment. Uh, it's, the models are written using something like a C-sharp-like language. So if you are a, a programmer or a tester, 
you may feel comfortable in the, doing the models. And uh, it's a simplified abstract version of the system under test. So that's an important thing, otherwise you're implementing the same thing two times. You have a requirement documentation, you have a real implementation. The model program is supposed to be a lightweight slice of the real implementation. Uh, and how lightweight it is depends on how much features you wanted to test. So usually we uh, simplify from a certain perspective, like okay, our goal is now to test whether the pub sub really works correctly. So we don't have to worry about fault management details and so on, we can abstract away. Or logging, for example, we can abstract away those. Um, we, what is the reason why the model program is usually simple? Because the model program deals with much less complex data structures than the real implementation. The real implementation would deal with pointers and structures and semaphores and so on. Model program won't have all those traditional multitasking related uh, uh, construct, constructs. Okay, we can model messages as simple as integers. I can. I don't have to deal with all the complex uh, structure of structures and messages can be modeled like that. Pipes can be modeled as set of integers. So instead of having a RPC communication from one task to another task, I can just have a, a list as a pipe and I can check whether message comes to the list or not. So we can just make an abstract representation of a complex program. That's the idea of the model program. Okay, one example, there's a lot of details here. I will not go through all of them. Uh, in, in case there is an interest, we can talk later. Uh, idea is to have for every action that you want to test a so-called rule program, uh, um, for example, in order to create a pipe, we would need a task name and, and a pipe name and a pipe depth. And the model program will compute those arguments and, com and, and return the result. And uh, th this return result will be compared against the actual create pipe implementation in, in C. Okay, So we have done, done some adapters that will compare the model's expectation to the real implementation's expectation. Okay. Um, interesting thing to note is that we capture requirements Okay. We capture the requirements inside here during the modeling time. Okay, we went through the documentation and found out what is the requirement for creating a pipe and we plug in the ID here. So the benefit is that it, the test cases have requirement IDs. So you have a traceability from generated test case to the, to the, to the, uh, uh, to the requirements. So you know uh, which test case covers a particular requirement automatically and the generator state machine will exactly show you why you are testing a certain transition because of the requirement ID embedded here. And it's also a good opportunity to identify missing requirements because um, right away you see, okay, what about the else part? I haven't written the else part here, okay. The, the, in this case, there are requirements, but I made it simplified to demonstrate the point. Uh, if, if you don't find a requirement ID for the else part, that means it's an unspecified requirement. The system has not specified what to do if the guard is violated, okay. So you find during this process, a lot of uh, uh, unspecified requirements usually. Okay, so a uh, model program has a lot of actions like creating a pipe, deleting a pipe, subscribe, unsubscribe, and so on. Uh, it follows the same style. So from this model program, you will uh, uh, let a tool to generate a state machine for you. The Spec Explorer will analyze it using uh, un under underlying constraint solver and generate a state machine from you uh, for you. And uh, uh, this state machine is basically uh, showing how uh, uh, the model program is organized, okay? And it shows, okay, you're in the state S0, uh, you can initialize a task, you can go and create a pipe, you can subscribe, and then you can uh, receive, uh, uh, send a message, and then you can delete. So it will generate a lot of test cases by just traversing this uh, state machine, okay? Uh, uh, and if the real implementation, say, let's assume, model expects create pipe to return true, right? If the real implementation returns false, then we say test failure, meaning either the model is incorrect or the or the implementation is incorrect. Something is incorrect, that's the idea of, of a test failure means. Okay, um, traditionally uh, we have been doing uh, uh, this kind of modeling uh, using um, Fraunhofer uh, tool, there is a Fraunhofer tool for that, um, by explicitly modeling the state space. So it, it helps for people who want to learn about model-based testing to, to get this idea of state-based thinking. Uh, but in this case, we generate this kind of state machine model from the model program, okay? Uh, so what kind of test cases would you get out? Uh, it's basically a path uh, from the, um, go back to the previous, oops, sorry. If I go back to this uh, state machine, every test case is a path from S0 to, here is S0 to S10. So every test case just takes this and traverse all the transitions and states as much as can, and then 
uh, shows you something like this. There are a couple of strategies that I'm not discussing. There is so-called long tests and short tests. Long tests will loop around the transitions so, so many times, so you could find a lot of interesting corner cases. Uh, uh, these are all short tests. It helps to uh, read the program. The generated program is very easy to read and debug and so on. So that's why I've shown here short tests. Okay, uh, these test cases are in the C sharp language. And then we have an adapter that takes the C-sharp language and convert it to C language because the, the software bus API uh, is, is only in, in the C language as far as I know. Okay. Um, if your system is in another language, you have to have an adapter that does this translation. Okay. Because this environment only works for the .NET world. All right. But, but you see it's a requirement based because we compare the expected result to the actual result. And uh, if there's a violation, we say that the requirement is wrong or the implementation is wrong. Okay, and um, the previous picture was only showing you one test case uh, with um, one task, in fact, um, just to be clear. Each chain is a test case, so we have four test cases, but then we always use one task in this case. But it becomes interesting to test a software versus multiple tasks, so we can instantiate our model program, say, generate more than one task at a time. And uh, there are many ways to configure the model program, so you could get a lot of test cases here. I don't think a human would generate this many test cases easily. Uh, it, it is possible, but it will take a lot of time, okay? And here is, is automated test case generation. And uh, if I zoom in further, I can show you one example, like, like for example, take the state uh, S70 is one test case. We create two tasks, and then we let both of them create uh, a pipe, and we let one of the tasks to subscribe, another task to send a message, and then we delete a pipe, delete a pipe, delete the tasks. So, so a different combination of uh, subscribe and unsubscribe are tested in all these sequences. Uh, this is a screenshot, that's why it's a little bit ugly here. I have a, a true things on the, on the left. It's coming from the other test case, so I try to zoom into a, a screen here, okay. All right, what I talked about requirement traceability earlier. So when, when we run the test cases, we also can see what what requirements were covered by each test case. So I have shown here requirement checked, requirement checked, and we can get a table like this in the end. We, we know exactly which test case uh, addresses which requirement. And th that's an important artifact for many of the safety critical systems um, we have been working with. Okay, uh, last year I presented something similar, and I was in a, a dinner table and discussed the architecture, and one guy told me that um, your, your one parent multiple child architecture is not really testing a lot of concurrency. So, so he said, why not you instantiate multiple parents? Then you could have multiple child, and then there will be more interleavings you could test. And I thought that's a great idea. So I went back home and then thought about it a little bit, and then refined the, the test architecture and came up with another idea that I could have many parents simultaneously running, and each parent could have many child tasks. And uh, uh, it will uh, uh, test a lot of interleavings because when this child task is running, this child is, all, is, is also running, right? And, and the OS can do a context switch in the middle of publish or in the middle of subscribe. So I could test more uh, features, uh, uh, concurrency related features by having so many parents up and running and with so many children tasks. So we automatically generate from the same model uh, this, uh, this architecture actually. And uh, we found it that this can discover more errors than the previous uh, strategy where there's only one parent at a time and, and multiple child tasks. Okay, so one more detail in the previous picture. Uh, we generate these test cases and we compile each test case into a shared object and dynamically load it using the OSEL API, which allows test cases to be dynamically loaded and unloaded. So that was a very helpful feature. And, and, and in, in the other strategy where we have multiple uh, uh, parents, we compile each parent into a separate shared object and load all of them simultaneously using the uh, CFE's uh, configuration file where we can just list the uh, objects to be loaded and it happily loads and runs for us. Okay, so a sample list of issues that were detected in this approach. Um, first of all, I must say, CFE is a very good quality software. The, the test cases and the test approach is extremely rigorous, so the number of test failures were very minimal. Okay, and uh, uh, there were some really interesting corner cases though, but uh, just to say, say the positive thing first before I, I say some, some failures. Huh? So, <laughs> okay. Um, off nominal behaviors were, were the most type of issues this approach detects. Uh, for example, trying to create a pipe and then create again and then try to delete, it won't work. 
So, so some of the data was corrupted in the process of orthonormal sequence of events. Um, so we found some infinite loops and race conditions, and I shared with the with the team, and they agreed and reviewed it, and uh, uh, caused some some memory issues and so on. Um, found uh, quite a few missing requirements. They were taken care of by the implementation, and it was documented as part of the API, but not in the requirements. So um, many times they were orthonormal requirements, and uh, uh, one or two duplicate requirements that were already cleaned up. Okay, one sample issue that I would like to explain is this, this scenario. Uh, we create a task, this is the create task. Uh, let's call it task name zero. And then we let the task zero to create a pipe zero with a name, uh, with a depth one. And then we delete the task. So now the task is deleted, right? So uh, we initialize the task again, and then try to create the same pipe. The system will say uh, pipe name taken because uh, it, the deleting the task didn't clean up the fact that the pipe name uh, was already created. So, so, so the model expects the, the, the create pipe to return true, but the actual return code was error name taken. That's because this delete task doesn't really go after and clean all the resources that were allocated uh, when we uh, uh, call the create pipe. Okay. And, and this is an interesting orthonormal scenario that uh, regular testing has, has missed, uh, we believe. And I looked at the code and I found out, uh, uh, of course, why the reason is that uh, whenever we do create pipe, um, there are some, some memory allocated and some variables initialized with the pipe names and so on, and they were not reset. That, that was the reason uh, this failed. And there's another interesting example and um, where uh, creating a pipe and then creating it again and then going after and deleting it would, would not work. Um, there are some, some events here which are not relevant. Uh, our test case generation doesn't optimize the, uh, the smallest subset of e events you should test for. So, so some events were not really uh, reasonable or not related to this, to this issue. For example, this event creating a pipe with the depth zero is not allowed. So there's no reason for, for this event uh, in, in this test sequence. But anyway, our test generator picked up that event. Um, the, the issue happened here when we tried to delete the pipe. So we first went ahead and create a pipe of depth one, successful, the system also accepted it. We try to create it again. We expect the return code to be false, and the system also return uh, false. That's good. And then we try to, uh, uh, this is not relevant. We try to delete the pipe zero. Uh, we expected uh, the return code to be true because we just created a pipe, right? But the system uh, failed uh, to do that. So the, the, because the pipe ID was corrupted in the, in the mean process of uh, sending a wrong create pipe and the model has corrupted the pipe ID data structure. Okay. and and and. This is just another sample of the type of issues you, you would uncover when you apply something like model-based testing. Okay. All right. So what is the major conclusion we can draw? Is that uh, MBD is, is, is a promising approach, and um, it requires um, not much effort to build the model. The model building itself is simpler, but the converting the model generated test cases into C test cases to interact with the systematic tests, that's the, the part that requires some, some work. Um, also, um, remember the model is an abstract representation, so so you have to have uh, uh, internal data structures to convert your model representation into the actual representation the system understands. For example, if you look at the API of, of a, a software bus, subscribe would take a pointer to a pipe uh, and, and message ID and so on. They are different data types, but in the model we treat message IDs as integer, and the pipe as a sequence, so we have to sort of map the, the difference in the level of abstraction using our adapter. That's where some, some manual work is needed. But once that bridge is established, everything is automated. It, uh, generating the test case is automated, running the test cases is also automated, and, and traceability is established automatically. Okay, and the major strength seems to be in detecting off nominal issues. Um, maybe I should also say CFS has been in, in, uh, used for maybe 10 years. Uh, or something like that. So, so there are not many opportunities to find really a core issue uh, of uh, calling a subscribe won't work or something like that. It's, in, it's almost impossible. If a uh, main feature would fail, that would be a real surprise. Um, so, so most of the time, well-tested software would have corner case issues like this, and uh, MBD can help uh, to detect them. Okay. Uh, we found out that the major strength is not necessarily just finding uh, uh, functional errors, but uncovering requirement issues. So which, what it means is that 
uh, we have applied MBD very late in the process, right? After they have done the testing, we did the modeling for testing. But you could also start doing modeling upfront, you know, like the model programs we have developed. You may not be able to run the test cases because there is no system or a test ready for you, but you could already uncover a lot of uh, requirements in this in this process of modeling each action. And, and that's where the actually the major strength is, right? And uh, you, you will essentially find functional errors when the when the system under test is ready in the late process. Okay. And uh, I would like to acknowledge a few people who helped this uh, work. Uh, this this work is sponsored by NASA through the SAR program, and uh, Martha supports us with Ken and Steve and Markland um, Benson, who is the NASA point of contact for this project, and. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Jonathan who attended one of our presentations and uh, if you have questions you can contact uh, the details uh, there. Okay, so now I'm ready to to your questions. Uh, very good. Other questions? <coughs> yeah, I was been advocating model-based testing for a long time. Okay. So way back when we used to do modeling of operating systems, secure operating systems for verification and proof. And what we learn is you never get the experts on the system to build that model. They will always put far too many details into it. You can talk to them, but do not let them make your models. Oh, okay. Uh, in, in our case, uh, we were not the developers of the CFS, of course. Uh, we took a, a different perspective, look at the API documentation, look at the sample test cases, and they have a lot of test cases also. And from there, we extracted the knowledge of uh, how to go about the modeling. Um, th there is another approach that I have been working on, sort of take existing test cases and generate models. Uh, um, maybe in the future workshops, I can uh, talk about them. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, so you, you mentioned at the, at the end of your talk about uh, running this on CFS, which is uh, you know obviously a very mature product at this time. Uh, have you done any work with similar approaches to more immature products or even taking the model that you have and running it on, you know, an old version of, of CFS that, you know, just to see what kind of issues you may find, even if they've already been fixed, just to see what the model might uncover? Yeah. Um, I, I, Michael is also working on another project with the NASA DAC system, so uh, maybe he can answer it. He, he's just back there. Yeah, so we're applying this to Saiji and a project at Goddard. It's done using agile methods, so we get the release uh, yeah, pretty often. And uh, so we use uh, the same kind of approach to test uh, a system under development. And yeah, it works really well for that also. Uh, for regression testing, when we get a new release, uh, sometimes we have to update the model. Sometimes uh, uh, one of the interfaces is a web-based interface. So sometimes the locator in, on the web page has changed, so we have to update that first. But then we can just rerun the, the regression test again. If they add a new function, we just add that to the model and, and generate test cases again. So it works really well, actually. Very good. Other questions? Yes. So I was wondering, uh, how do you verify the model? Oh, okay, very good question. Uh, sometimes it's interesting that I skip out certain details and lose exactly the question on that. Uh, um, we, we use model checker, the SPIC Explorer has something called model invariant checker. So you uh, uh, identify all the requirements the model should satisfy and, and make them as invariant. And then a SPIC Explorer will explore the state space and check whether the model itself is correct. Meaning, let's assume you wanted to check whether the model can do delete pipe whenever a pipe is created. So Spec Explorer will explore all possible states and then say, oh, if my uh, state is this, you can't delete a pipe anymore. So it will check uh, uh, whether your, your model program is consistent with the requirements that you identified. So that's a model checking is the underlying engine for that. Uh, your test cases kind of showed like a linear flow through your test cases, but you're um, claiming that this is doing a good job of testing your um, multi-threaded uh, race condition kind of uh, situations. So how do you how do you square that together? Are you doing a standoff between uh, the different steps so that you ensure that they actually execute in the right order? And if you're doing something like that, how does that uh, prove your your multi-threading? Okay, so 
uh, first of all, uh, we make no claim that we find all uh, uh, concurrency related issues because it's not model checking, it's still model based testing. It means we're, we're running test cases and we hopefully find concurrency issues because we're generating a lot of test cases, okay? Um, okay, how are we testing concurrency features? There are two strategies I discussed. The first strategy, we have one parent, multiple child tasks. There, we are only testing whether message travels from one task to another task, okay? We are not testing whether there are interleaving problems when publisher is interrupted in the middle, somebody else is subscribing, will, the, will that create any problem? But that strategy won't any, detect any race condition or something like that, okay? Uh, uh, the strategy two would detect race condition problems because we have multiple parents running and the operating system will do context switch because of multiple tasks up and running, but we are not really controlling the OS to try uh, uh, context switch at different moments. We are not doing that yet. Um, but uh, having multiple child means the OS will eventually transfer the content from one child to another, another child. Thereby, we, we are hoping that we are covering more and more uh, concurrency related uh, uh, features. Okay? Um, we are not really uh, uh, proving that, uh, that uh, whenever a message is published, it will reach all the subscribers. No, there is no proof like that. Other questions? Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's about 9.20. Why don't we take a break for about 20 minutes, come back at uh, 9.40.